Hello, happy Friday, everyone, and welcome to the Rockford Systems Safeguarding 101 for Metalworking Machines webinar. Before Roger gets started, I wanted to take just a brief moment to introduce Rockford Systems to you. We deliver innovative machine safeguarding solutions to organizations working with industrial machinery. We are located in Rockford, Illinois, offering turnkey machine safeguarding solutions since 1971. As a trusted advisor to industry, Rockford Systems educates organizations on how to interpret and apply the complex OSHA regulations and ANSI standards for machine guarding. In addition, Rockford offers a full suite of machine safety solutions, ranging from machine safeguarding assessments and risk assessments through installation and ongoing compliance validation. Safeguarding industrial machines helps organizations increase compliance, reduce risk, and ultimately improve profitability. Here's just a quick visual on our range of turnkey solutions. So as reported in Safety and Health magazine, a lack of machine guarding is consistently on OSHA's top 10 most cited violations report, resulting in over $7 million in fines each year. The actual price tag for an injury is much higher than simply the OSHA citation because indirect costs must also be taken into account, such as damaged facilities or equipment, medical expenses, lawsuits, lost productivity, replacement personnel, and so on. Worst of all, these accidents can cause extremely severe, potentially life-changing injuries to employees or even death. It's estimated that workers who operate and maintain machinery suffer approximately 18,000 amputations, lacerations, crushing injuries, abrasions, and most profoundly, more than 800 deaths per year. So with less than 50% of industrial machines properly safeguarded, we hope that today's webinar will help make machine safety a top priority in your organization. So why safeguard? Well, it's very simple. It's the right thing to do, and it is the law. So here's just a quick overview of our agenda. I'm not going to go through this list, um, but I'm going to let you know that we're here to help interpret OSHA 29 CRF and ANSI B11 standards as they relate to specific machine applications and production requirements. And with that, I'll turn the presentation over to Roger Harrison. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Roger Harrison. I'm the Director of Training at the company, and we're going to talk to you this morning about a basic overview of machine safeguarding for mostly metalworking machines, although this does carry over to other equipment as well. So OSHA regulations are either state or feder federally administered. I think there's 23 states that have a state-approved plan now, and the rest use federal. The American National Standards Metalworking have been around since the 1920s and are updated about every five years. NFPA 79 is the electrical standard we're going to center on, although NFPA 70E will be also mentioned. Canadian Standards Association, we've got some things on robots there that differ from the U.S. regulations, so when we get to that point, keep that in mind. OSHA's 1910-212, the general requirements for all machines, is probably the biggest umbrella standard in OSHA, aside from 5A1, the general duty clause, of course. So this requires the employer to protect the operator and other employees in the machine area from exposure to recognized hazards. Now, point of operation hazards where the machine comes together to make the part are probably the most serious injuries, so there's a lot of attention paid to that. Ingoing nip points, rotating parts. Uh, keep in mind that you need 
to cover rotating components up to at least a seven foot level above the floor to meet OSHA, eight feet to meet the more stringent ANSI standards. Flying chips and sparks <clears throat> is where they make a reference to the use of shields on cutting and turning machines to knock down chips and coolant, as well as to keep people out of rotating components like a rotating chuck would be on an engine lathe. Five safeguarding methods. If you're looking for an overview, ANSI B1119 would be the standard you want to get a hold of. Uh, last published in 2010 with an update due in 2018. You can get these as a hard copy or with PDF uh, for about $85 a piece. The five topics covered there would be guards, we talk about both point of operation and perimeter guards, devices such as light curtains, palm buttons, um, pressure sensitive mats, uh, laser devices, and so on. Safeguarding by distance, also known as safe holding. Safeguarding by operator location, also known as safe position of controls. Now those two, you say, well, what's the number? What is the distance? What is the location? That's something you have to fill in on your risk assessment because it's really not defined in these standards. Safe opening is a quarter inch or less at the point of operation when the machine is fully open. So if it doesn't open up more than a quarter inch, do you need a safeguarding beyond a device beyond that? Um, many cases, no, you don't. If you look at risk assessment like Lego blocks, you've got three primary areas there. Severity of injury with the red at the top left, probability with the yellow, and frequency of exposure in the blue. Now, if you look below that, see the little word avoidance there in that box down below? Severity plus probability plus, plus frequency plus avoidance. Well, that avoidance has recently come on in the ANSI B113 2012 standard on press brakes and is, uh, in that case, based on the speed of the machine. The slower the machine, the easier it is to escape if you are in the point of operation once the cycle has begun. So that should be added as a fourth factor when you're trying to calculate a hazard risk number. And that's what you're trying to come up with in doing the matrix on a risk assessment. There's a number to tell you how dangerous that machine is or that portion of the machine so you can assign the correct safeguarding device to it. Now one more standard at the bottom there, ANSI B110-2015 is the risk assessment standard for industrial machinery, and that's another good one, good one to uh, get a hold of. The line drawings that you see here, as well as others, are found in OSHA's uh, Avoiding Amputations booklet, and I think it's on OSHA.gov, and it's pretty easy to find. Uh, at one time they had this in a hard copy booklet. I think maybe now it's limited to PDF, but it shows you where you need to put covers up to at least a seven foot level from the floor or working platform. Now speaking of exposures to hazards, here's four different photographs showing relatively minor exposure levels to hazards, and I'm talking about a coil payoff on a press, which you can either surround with a railing or a chain or a cable, um, and a danger sign. Um, you see several different ways to do that there, but that's only for lower level exposures, not the primary safeguarding at the point of operation, no. Point of operation safeguarding, here we're looking at a point of operation guard on a press, uh, it's supposed to be set up so that you cannot reach over it, under it, through it, or around it, if you take, which if you take the first letters there is outa, this guard should keep you out of here, easy way to remember it. Now that reach through on the left side there shows an opening that's big enough for somebody to put their hand through. Yes, that's a, a problem. <clears throat> Need to tighten up that um, those holes. Um, considerations for transparent guards. When you look at the polycarbonate or Lexan there, they suggest that you consider replacing that every two or three years because the impact prote protection uh, degrades over time. So what are the requirements for a guard in uh, the view of OSHA regulations and ANSI standards? Well, we already mentioned the first one, something you can't reach over, under, around, or through even if you really tried. Second one is a measurement scale, which OSHA refers to as Table O-10, to control guard openings and guard distances so that a small hand can't reach far enough through to get hurt. Third one is no pinch points between the guard and moving machine parts. You have to be careful of how you design and install the guard so that you don't 
create a hazard by the way you've mounted the guard. Good visibility into the point of operation, which will differ from one application to another. Fasteners not readily removable means you need a tool to access the guard or take it off or even to open up a hinge door. Um, OSHA doesn't like to see wing nuts on these guards. Now down at the bottom are two points that have an asterisk next to them because they're not actually found in OSHA regulations but instead an ANSI standard. And they're common sense, materials strong enough to protect people and free from sharp edges that could injure people. They just don't happen to be listed within OSHA. Speaking of the guard opening measurement scale, the one at the top there that OSHA uses has been around way before OSHA. 1948, it was an insurance company and the ANSI Standard Writing Committee that came up with that based on a woman's size 6 glove with average finger length. Later on in the 90s, they came up with an alternate scale for even smaller hands. I think that's a woman's size 4 glove with average finger length. Uh, for companies that employed um, a high percentage of, I think it was Asian uh, workers, have much smaller hands. So both of those scales are available for purchase on our website should you need one. If you compare the two guard opening scales to each other side by side, going through an identical size hole in the end of the guard, which is shown at the lower left there, uh, you can see that the OSHA scale locks on the third stair step of this scale, whereas the ANSI scale on the right locks on the last stair step. And of course, the reason for the difference is the fact that one is based on a size 6 glove, one's based on a size 4 glove. If you look at the photo on the top right, you can see that the OSHA scale, the tip of the OSHA scale, does not reach the die, which is a good thing. You pass the test on the OSHA scale. Whereas the ANSI scale, just below it, goes not only to the die, but a few inches into it. So you flunk the test on the ANSI scale. Could you fix the problem? Yeah, if you could move the guard a little further away or make the opening smaller, either one of them would take care of that issue. Now, the guard interlocks today are not only requiring a unique geometry on the key, which is shown at the lower left, but some also have a latching feature, like the one at the top right. So when you latch the door shut, there's an electric solenoid inside that yellow switch that grabs the black tab and holds onto it, won't let it go, until the hazardous motion behind the guard has come to a stop. Latching or locking interlock switches are some of the newer technology that the four or five manufacturers, major manufacturers of interlocks all offer. Function testing your guard interlocks, one, to make sure they're working, and two, to make sure they haven't been cheated, is what's required by a function test checklist, which the ANSI standards all mention and have for some years. Now, most of these function test checklists are generic, which for a guard, which for a two-hand control, is usually acceptable. For something like a light curtain or a laser scanner, no. No, you need a make model specific function test procedure for those, which you usually have to get from the manufacturer of that safety device. Looking at a two hand control as a possible safeguarding device, um, yeah, if you're manually feeding one part at a time into, for instance, a press, there's some things you have to consider to make sure it's really a safeguarding device all by itself like the fact that the buttons need to be protected from unintended operation with the ring guards around them in this case. It's got to have an anti-repeat circuit, so you have to push and release both buttons for every cycle that you get. Concurrent half-second time limit between pressing button A and button B prevents you from tying one of the buttons down. So a half-second time limit. Holding time must maintain contact or pressure on the buttons until the dies are closed during the hazardous portion of the cycle. Interrupted stroke protection. If you let one of the two buttons go during the down stroke, the machine stops. Then you can't go back to the one you let go of to finish. You have to release both buttons, re come back to both buttons to resume an interrupted stroke. Anchored at a safety distance based on the machine stopping time has always been an OSHA requirement, and there's one safety distance formula for OSHA and then a more conservative distance for the ANSI standard that we'll get into later on. Light curtains, infrared optical presence sensing devices have been around since the mid-1950s. 
Bike curtains are currently manufactured by over 20 different companies worldwide. And as you can see there, it says uh, can only be used on machines that can stop consistently and immediately anywhere in their stroke or cycle without damaging the machine, the tooling, the work, or creating the hazard. You can't tear things up by using a light curtain. It's got to be a match for that machine. Two different categories of light curtains. On the right side there with those photographs include point of operation where the beams, the light beams are close together. So if you were to reach through the light curtain sensing field flat-handed with these closely spaced beams, you'd send a stop signal in time to keep the operator from getting hurt if his hand kept going. That's a point of operation light curtain. And there's a perimeter light curtain on the far right that's got much further spaced beams. They refer to it as minimum object sensitivity. And that's designed for people who may walk through the sensing field as opposed to reaching through the sensing field. So point of operation and perimeter. Here we got a mechanical power press with three very common means of safeguarding. One is the yellow light bars in the front. Two is the two-hand control with the yellow side wings around them on the palm buttons. And three is the hard guard that goes around the sides and the back of the machine. That's common on presses and common on other machines as well. Now, do you need all three of those? Uh, it depends on what you're doing. In some cases, no. In many cases, you could just use a foot switch along with a light guard. How about a three-beam light system where it's going around the corner with a mirror? Yeah, you can do that, keeping in mind that you want no more than... <coughs> 24 inches space between the light beams, and at the bottom you want to try to ma maintain no more than six inches opening. So a three beam system works well for doing that and going around the corner. You can do two things with light curtains. You can mute the light curtain, that is to turn it off during the non-hazardous portion of the cycle, assuming the machine it's applied to has a non-hazardous portion of the cycle. And uh, you can also blank, which we're gonna talk about on the next slide. So the light curtain must be active from TDC at the top, that's top dead center with a crankshaft rotation, down to the quarter inch die opening, at which point you have the option to automatically turn it off for the balance of the cycle. That's muting and it's usually done to speed up productivity. The next one would be blanking. You can see that there's uh, blanker covers on these light curtains. If you look at the photograph on the right, the blanker covers are near the bottom and I think there's 10 in a row. Problem is, so much of that light curtain is blanked out that somebody could stand next to the machine, reach their hand through the sensing field, and get all the way into the moving dies without ever sending a stop signal. The one at the top left does have some blanking going in at the far end, um, which looks to be fairly reasonable for the setup that they've got there. So there's reasonable blanking and there's over blanking going on there. Every light curtain has function indicator lights somewhere on it. Red, amber, and green. Not necessarily in that position on the light curtain, but that's what they happen to be here. Now you need those function test indicator lights to do the checks when you change operator, die, or ship. The function test checklist requires the use of those indicator lights. Now you see where it says no protection below this line? That's either referred to as a dead zone line or as a t detection zone limit because no the light curtain sees nothing below that black line. Well, the significance of that is if you have somebody that might accidentally reach underneath that line, which is oftentimes based on the way you mount the light curtain, you gotta pay attention to the instructions. It says there's a dead zone, that's not a protection area. So you may have to mount the light curtain a little bit lower to avoid somebody reaching through that dead zone. So function testing light curtains needs to be a make model specific procedure, which this one is not. If you can read that top line, that's a generic procedure. So why have a generic procedure if every light curtain manufacturer has their own individual make model specific function test procedure? Well, the reason is some of the light curtain manufacturers are no longer around. So you have to start with something in making your own function test procedure. But wherever possible, go to the light curtain manufacturer, go on their website, look for function test procedures, as well as uh, those black rods in the lower right corner. Those are test rods that are used as part of, part of the function test procedure. 
and must be a very specific diameter. Both the fat one and the skinny one have to be a specific diameter to make this work. Safety distance for two-hand control or light curtains. This is the basic OSHA formula that's been out there since 1971 to um, calculate that safety distance. However, you have to have something that measures the stopping time of the machine in milliseconds in order to multiply by the 63 inches per second hand speed constant, also known as the average reaching speed, in order to calculate that distance. Um, now, the ANSI standard, more current ANSI standards, have more um, conservative distances. Like, for instance, where light curtains are concerned, you have to be 40 to 50 percent further away than you have to be with the OSHA formulas. You want to consider which one you want to use in your company. Is it OSHA safety distance or is it ANSI safety distance, especially for light curtains? This is a portable stop time measurement device being used on a press. Uh, they're actually checking the light curtain safety distance here with the black device in the middle of the photo. Um, that's something that may be, that feature is something that may be included in your press controls if they're relatively recent solid state control systems, meaning that you wouldn't need a portable meter if it was built into your press control system. But anyway, you want to make sure you have documented stop time measurement readings for any machine using light curtains or palm buttons as a safeguarding device. Uh, you don't just guess as to where you put a light curtain. You've got to calculate this, and that may require employing the use of somebody that does stop time readings uh, as a consultant or buying your own meter like this one. Those of you who may have or see mechanical power presses, how about punch presses, stamping presses, understand that OSHA says, this is at the bottom of the slide, that mechanical power presses require an electrically interlocked safety block to prop up the weight of the slide in the upper die should the breaker counterbalance fail. So this is for mechanical power presses. It's got an interlock plug. So the safety block sits down in a holder somewhere down on the side of the machine. When you want to use it, you pull the plug, which cuts the main motor power. Then you've got to wait for the flywheel to coast to a stop before you can place the uh, block between the dies. Very important that you have an interlock plug and that you wait for the flywheel to come to a stop. Uh, so interlock safety blocks. Um, let's see here. What else? We got? Oh, yes, light curtains. Light curtains for, in this case, a press break or bending machine um, give you that same infrared sensing field as we saw on a press. Now, this one is set up so that the operator, when he's outside of the sensing field of that vertical light curtain, can step on the foot switch. The machine comes down to a preset stopping position, leaving just enough space in the dies to place the material or the piece part. Now he can hold on to the part because the light curtain's muted or turned off. Remember that? Make another depression on the foot switch, bend the part, and remove it. So foot down, foot through sequence is possible with a light curtain on a press brake bending die like that. Also possible on a press brake, or at least hydraulic press brakes and maybe uh, servo drive press brakes, is a laser device. The advantage of a laser device versus a light curtain on a press brake is it's got zero safety distance in the way you mount it. Therefore, somebody can reach up close and handhold the part as it bends without any interference from the laser device. So lasers, you don't need uh, any distance at all. What do they call this? You want to Google it? Well, that's close proximity, point of operation, laser active optical protective devices. Found with a zero safety distance, you find it in ANSI B113 2012 version. So AOPDs is how they're referenced. I think there's four or five manufacturers if you check these out. One being laser safe. But remember, only for hydraulic or servo drives. They will not work on mechanical press brakes because mechanical press brakes don't stop fast enough to justify the use of a device mounted with zero distance. So <clears throat> laser devices are good for hand-holding small parts, like they're doing at the top and down at the bottom for parts that have a tall side leg. If you had a tall side leg and you're trying to use a light curtain, you have to blank out so much of the light curtain that you could put your hand in next to it. It wouldn't be doing you much good. So 
the laser devices have been out there since 2001 and have three or four pages in the current ANSI B113 standard, which tells us they're here to stay. Danger signs are important on any machine. When there's accidents, there's uh, oftentimes a lot of litigation that centers around the fact that warnings were not provided to recognize hazards. So danger signs need, yeah, never, never do this, always, always do that, but they also need pictograms for a visual depiction of what hazards are. And here's the three most common hazards on a press brake. Somebody gets their fingers in the die at the top or on the bottom, the fingers may get pinched by a box bent when somebody doesn't know where to reach or hold onto the part. Over on the right side, they may be struck by the piece part as it bends up if they're not used to running uh, a press brake. So danger signs need pictograms, and um, you can buy most of these signs. Most people um, do that, but it's possible to make your own, too. If you do that, you'll want to depend on uh, some ANSI standards for color coding. I think it's ANSI Z535 series for color coding to make signs. Okay, moving on here uh, to grinders. Grinders are a machine that frequently draw OSHA violations because of the opening between the work rest and the wheel being too big. So if you have an opening that's too big there, you can get a piece part caught in between, and as this thing is turning several thousand RPM, shatter the wheel. And when a grinding wheel shatters, it literally explodes, which, by the way, is a reason that most of the shops that I've been in over the past 20 years use both a full face shield as well as safety glasses. Is that actually in a regulation? You got to do that? No, but you can't be too safe on grinders. A full face shield as well as safety glasses. Up at the top there, the quarter inch opening between the tongue guard and the wheel, um, also known as the spark arrestor, that's the second thing they look for on grinders, as well as a wheel cover that covers the spindle end and nut. That's also a big deal. See, grinders are referred to as a vertical regulation as far as OSHA is concerned. 1910 215 covers this. Uh, just like mechanical power presses are a vertical or machine-specific regulation. What's that mean with a vertical or machine-specific regulation? There's a list of do's and don'ts for each machine. It's very clear in what you have to have for safeguarding. And in some reasons, the stuff you cannot use for safeguarding. So with grinders, here's a good example of a test device for eighth-inch opening between the work rest and the wheel and quarter-inch opening between the tongue guard and the wheel. And that grinder gauge you're looking at is available for purchase on our website as well. How about a horizontal bandsaw? <clears throat> well, the one at the top left has a guard for the unused portion of the blade like it's supposed to. That's good, which is adjustable depending on the size of the part that you're cutting. The one at the bottom may have a blade guard folded up in the housing over the hood but if they do, it's not adjusted right because there's an exposed portion of the blade and that's something that OSHA would cite because it's on their list of do's and don'ts. Pressure-sensitive mats anchored to the floor um, are a common safeguarding method for horizontal tube benders like this. Now, if you're using mats, a couple things you want to remember. First of all, you can see the yellow ramp all the way around that L-shaped mat. That's designed to anchor the mat to the concrete so people don't shove the mats out of the way for their own convenience, which they will. Number two, you don't want any space between the mats because there's actually three separate mats there. If you take a look, you don't want somebody to be able to sneak between. Number three, it needs to be large enough so that if somebody approached the point of operation near the top center there, uh, you want to make sure this hazardous motion has stopped by the time they get there. Well, it depends on how fast the machine stops and how large the mat is. Is there actually a formula for that? Not that I'm aware of. No. So pressure-sensitive mats. Radio frequency antenna devices. Um, these are not real commonly used anymore, but they're out there. I think there's one or two manufacturers left. It's considered a present sensing safeguarding device in the capacitive um, category. So it uh, measures the capacitance of the, uh, the electrical capacitance of somebody reaching toward the antenna as they're standing there on the floor. It's adjustable in sensitivity. Um, it's supposed to be able to see you about 18 inches away, but if somebody gets inside the control box because they're frustrated by nuisance stops, 
They can turn 18 inches down to one or two inches, which of course provides virtually no protection. So you gotta lock up the control box once the supervisor, setup person, and the operator set this up in the morning, and that's something they have to do before every operating shift. Drop probe devices, also known as ring drop devices, also known as halo devices, mechanically verify the absence of hands or fingers into the point of operation, and they're most likely going to be used on riveters. Riveters have about a 95% success rate using a device like this. So on the left side there is a riveter. See the control box at the top center? There's a, a thin uh, wire probe that drops down. It's got a loop on the end so that when the operator puts the piece part on the anvil down below, steps on a foot switch, goes to cycle the machine, first thing that happens is the probe drops down to just above the part to make sure the only thing underneath the probe is the piece part, not your finger along with it. Because if the probe can't drop all the way down to the bottom of its travel, the machine won't cycle. That's how it works. It works very well on a riveter. Uh, the operators like them because, number one, they don't slow them down. They still get very good productivity. Um, they can still handhold the part, and they can still use a foot switch, which is the main things they're concerned about. On the right-hand side, you see a drop probe device on a spot welder. Not quite as successful as far as the number of applications, maybe 65% on these. But this is designed to be a long stroke drop probe device meant specifically for spot welders. How about lays? Manual engine lays a um, couple things here. First of all, the number one hazard is starting up the lathe, forgetting that the chuck key is still in the chuck, which is why you shouldn't store the chuck key in the chuck. It's a bad place to put it, which is why correct that down in the lower right corner is a spring-loaded self-ejecting chuck wrench just like mechanical power presses need a spring-loaded self-ejecting turnover bar to manually turn the flywheel over same things required here on a lathe uh, plus in the top right corner of the photo you see a manual motor starter the old mechanical click to turn it on and off the problem with those is they don't have any dropout protection so if you lose power while that machine is running then the power comes back 15, 20 minutes later, that lathe's going to restart unexpectedly. That's why you want to replace a manual motor starter with a magnetic motor starter to provide dropout protection, also known as anti-restart. Here are four engine lathes, all equipped with a hinged chuck shield, if you look closely there. The hinge chuck shields are all in the open or up position and getting ready to do in this new setup there. You say, well, is this thing a guard that provides over, under, around, or through? No, this is not a guard. It doesn't offer the same level of protection as a guard. It merely keeps you from accidentally coming in contact with the outer periphery of the chuck, or the work holder, while it's turning <clears throat> because a lathe has a great deal of torque. And if you get clothing tangled up in it, uh, it can be a very gruesome accident. So as simple as it looks, a hinge chuck shield is very important to have, even though it doesn't meet the requirements of a guard. How about adding an interlock switch built into the hinge of either a chuck shield on the left or a chip coolant shield on the right? Uh, these are actually European designs, and the reason for the interlock switch being in a separate enclosure is to make it more difficult to cheat or bypass. So, yes, there is a, a way to meet the best practices for these shields by using an interlocked version of them. How about just a simple universal ball and socket shield the one on the left being used on a drill press and the one on the right being used on a vertical mill, like a bridge board. That's the simplest version of shield you can get. Many manufacturers offer that, including our company. Uh, and its only purpose is to knock down chips and coolant. Very simple to maintain. Just lubricate the um, hinge parts. Um, anyway, very versatile. How about a... <clears throat> telescopic chuck shield, which is, is designed for a drill press. It's got three segments, 
segments, two of which telescope into the other one, and you can flip it up out of the way when you're not using it. Uh, they come in two different arbor sizes depending on the diameter of the quill on your machine. And um, they're actually a two for one if you think about it. Number one, they knock down chips and coolant towards the rear because they have an open back on them as you can see. And number two, they limit your access to rotating components like the drill bit, the chuck, the shaft. So it's sort of a 219 shield as well as a chip coolant shield. People seem to like those. Uh, it's a British product, actually. Area laser scanners. Um, these have been around, out since about 1994. They can take the place of pressure-sensitive mats where mats get torn up or damaged because of fork trucks or chemicals. You see there's two ways to use them here. On the left side, you have area guarding. On the right side, you have access guarding. Well, the vast majority of applications here are on the left side, area guarding, mounted horizontally down near the floor, down around between ankle and shin height, something like that. The ones on the right for access guarding, uh, you don't see those as often for several reasons. Uh, first of all, they're more expensive than a light curtain would be, which is normally what you'd see. There's a light curtain. Um, secondly, they have a longer reaction time, therefore their safety distance is greater. And thirdly, they have a lower classification as far as category or type, as far as performance level, as well as um, there's a third factor for those, and that would be the safety integrity level. So type or category, performance level, sill level are all lower than light curtains, and yet the cost is higher. So you don't see a lot of them applied like they do on the right-hand side here. Safeguarding an automation cell. Anything with robots in it usually requires a combination of safeguarding. There's a perimeter guard around this, there's a point of operation light curtain, there's grab wire cables, there's various types of interlock switches, um, all of which have to report back to some sort of input that accepts the safety inputs to tell you what needs to be reset. The machine's running along, all of a sudden it stops, uh, you got to figure out why and correct it. Perimeter guards for robot applications. Um, what you're looking for here, just as you're walking by, is the fence height. It used to be down at the uh, bottom here. It had 12 inches open at the bottom, and 60 inches from floor to top rail was acceptable in the American National Standard Robotic Industries Association, R15.06, from 1999. Problem is people could crawl underneath that fence if there was 12 inches open. So the best practice today you can find in the Canadian standard, Canadian robot standard that is, for six inches at the bottom of the fence and 72 inches for the height. And some companies go with 84 for the height of the fence now. Plus you're looking for updated types of interlock switches on these. As far as conveyors, there are six conveyor sheets like this with line drawings and explanations of basic hazards available from the Conveyor Equipment Manufacturers Association or cmanet.org at the bottom of the page, only two of which show up here. And they are offered at no charge. You can print them up in color and then plastic laminate them to attach to the conveyor to do training for. There's another conveyor company, uh, hytrol.com, H-Y-T-R-O-L.com, that offers conveyor placards in both English on one side, Spanish on the other side which may be something that you need to consider. As far as grab wire e-stop cables, emergency stop, this gives you an emergency stop capability for the entire length of the cable, which could be up to a couple of hundred feet and may allow you to not need individual red emergency stop buttons spaced at a certain distance apart. So if you've got conveyors that start up automatically, you need an audible or visual warning device on the left there, on the left side there. Uh, manual reset or start with the location where the e-stop was initiated is what you see on the right side with that e-stop, I'm sorry, with that e-stop cable and reset feature. You may notice that those warning tags have pictograms on them, like we said before. Now for emergency stops, you want a red mushroom shape button with a manual latch feature. So when you push it down, it stays engaged. An immediate background that's yellow 
and buttons that are readily accessible wherever the operator is working. So there's different versions of these, but they require a manual reset as opposed to the old momentary switches, which when you let them go, return to the open or the up position. National Fire Protection Association 70E is for an overall electrical safety program. This is where arc flash, arc flash is addressed when somebody has to work on an electrical panel while it's still energized. Uh, you want to make sure you have a copy of this and that you follow it, especially for those arc flash issues. 70E, I believe there's a 2015 version of that. Then there's NFPA 79, the Electrical Standard for Industrial Machinery, which covers the things we've been talking about. Main power disconnect switch, uh, which, by the way, then the main motor start button needs a shroud or a ring around it. Plus, we need dropout protection in the form of an electromagnetic starter. Voltage reduction using step-down transformers, properly grounded circuits, emergency stops, and three different categories of motor stop controls. Those are all found in NFPA 79, and there's also a 2015 version of that. As far as the um, starters are concerned, you see the one in the center on the right-hand side? That's a spring-loaded push button. That's how you know if you have a magnetic motor starter or not, a spring-loaded push button. Of course, the ring around it protects it from unintended operation. Disconnects need to be lockable only in the off position, whether it's a rotary-type disconnect switch like the one on the right or a flange-type disconnect switch like the one on the left. We just talked about the red emergency stop features. And on the left-hand side with the flange-type disconnect, the holes line up when you're in the down or off position, at which point you can place a lock for lockout tag-up. Okay, well, thank you, Roger. Um, very comprehensive job. Uh, we'd like to now start the question and answer portion of today's webinar. <clears throat> So um, feel free to type your question into the chat box, or if you have a more uh, detailed and involved question, please feel free to email your question to roger.harrison at rockfordsystems.com. Thanks, Roger and Carrie, for a great presentation. My name is Benita. I'm the Managing Editor of ISHN, and I'll be handling the Q&A portion. So now we'll have our presenters address some questions that have been submitted throughout the program. First question, could you clarify the difference between a stop category and a safety category? Actually, that's something I would have to look up. I'm familiar, but I'd have to have something in front of me to give you an exact answer on that. If you wouldn't mind emailing me, I would appreciate it. Okay, next question. If an abrasive grinder has a soft wheel, can it be operated without tongue guard and tool rest? Yes, there's some things with grinders that do not fall under ANSI's 1910.215 and soft grinding wheels like scotch bright wheels, buffing wheels, polishing wheels, wire brushes, scratch brushes uh, are among them. You do not have to meet the rules for grinders with those, and also um, Sanders is also in there. That did not have to meet the, the rules for grinders. They fall under 1910-212 general requirements, which requires the employer to protect people with something, and most cases there would be PPE, either face shields and or safety glasses. Okay, next question. For CNC machines, can they have plugs into extension cords with locking devices? Uh, to my, it's my understanding there, no. They cannot have extension cords with them. Okay. Next, how often should stop time readings be performed during the equipment runtime? Stop time measurement devices on presses is where they're most um, or they're best clarified, should be done as part of the periodic and regular inspection under 1910-217 paragraph G in OSHA, which is generally quarterly, four times a year. When you first install light curtains or palm buttons, you need to check the stopping time, safety distance, and then the 2009 version of ANSI P11-1 
falls out that this should be part of your periodic and regular inspection program quarterly. Okay, next question. Can you put a partial cover around an emergency stop to prevent operator from hitting or does emergency stop need to be completely open? If you're asking me if there's a standard or regulation that is, you know, that clarifies that, no. I have heard complaints from OSHA compliance officers when they have rings or shrouds around emergency stops only because they make them less accessible in an emergency, but not something that actually says you can't do it. If you have a ring or shroud around there and it comes from the manufacturer of the button, I can tell you this, that you're better off with a larger diameter ring than the diameter of the button. The bigger the space you have around the button between there and the ring, the better because it gives you more clearance when you come at it from an angle which you might be doing. In other words, you don't want the ring to be tight fitting around the button if you have one, but preferably you'd have no ring at all and no shroud, partial shroud or cover either. I've seen, I've seen the partial covers and shrouds for emergency stops on conveyors so nothing falls off the conveyor under the emergency stop button. But if you have a safety complaint from OSHA or insurance company loss control people, that may be where they're coming from. Next question. Do the lead screws on the side of the lathe need to be guarded? You have a slide that I'm shows some that you asked that question guarding. because I forgot to talk about that. Um, that is a rotating component hazard, and the best practice is to use one of these telescopic sleeves uh, that you can get from uh, Centrico.com, C-E-N-T-R-Y-C-O.com, a company in Burlington, New Jersey, who offers those. There's another one here in Rockford, Illinois, B-U-W-W.com, that offers these sleeves. If you want um, a self-taught lesson on that, go on to Yale Lathe Fatality. Google Yale, Y-A-L-E, Lathe Fatality. It explains how a young woman lost her life about six years ago in a chemistry laboratory out there because she didn't re properly restrain her hair and got it caught into the lead screw fee rod, traverse rod, camshaft, I'm not sure, one of those four, and did not have those sleeves on there. So there was a big concern. Um, unfortunately, that's what it took, but a big concern for installing those once that accident had occurred. Next question, would counter type mixers and equipment required to be bolted down or secured to counter? There's a general thing in OSHA that says that any industrial machine, which I suppose you could classify that as, has to be anchored down to the floor in most cases, although in that case it might be a big heavy bench. Uh, so it doesn't move. Um, as far as mixers go and be able, being able to reach at the top, I know our um, sales manager, vice president of sales, knows of a cover or a guard you can put over the tops of the bowls. Can you discuss guarding again for spot welder machine? For spot welders, there are drop probe devices, as I described, which are fairly low investment. There's um, a device out there that you can retrofit or buy as part of a new welder referred to as soft touch. I believe it's a Unitrol product, which is significantly more expensive as I've been told. Uh, for spot welding, if you have safe holding of a large bulky part, and again, you come up with the numbers for how far away you gotta be. So you're spot welding in a, in a one point and your hands are X number of inches away, that could be um, a method of safeguarding. If you can fixture the part in place, you could set it up with a two-hand control. I was thinking of how they um, welded the clips on basketball hoops. On a, they snapped the, the hoop on a fixture, and then they used a two-hand control, which came down and did the spot welding while their hands were safely occupied on the palm button. So there are other methods of doing that. Okay, next question. With buffing wheels, do the shaft and the bolt attaching the wheel need to be guarded? I'm not sure. I know they do for grinding wheels. Yes, you need a, a wheel cover to cover the uh, spindle end and the nut. 
and you need to use all the fasteners to attach the wheel cover to the machine. But that's for hard grinding wheels. As far as for buffing wheels, um, it seems to me I see quite a bit of those open, but whether there's any regulatory issue, that I'd have to look up and find out because I'm not sure. Okay, next question. On the dead zone line on a light curtain, is this line typically etched into the frame or is this a simple paint sticker? I'm glad you asked me that question because on a lot of light curtains, the dead zone or detection zone limit line isn't there. They don't mark it. You gotta test that with some sort of a object like one of your test rods and find out where the light curtain uh, ends at the bottom. So um, anyway, that's that's about the best I can tell you. Check your light curtains and mark them if they're not marked with some sort of permanent marker to make sure that somebody cannot reach underneath them, particularly if you have an operator that's seated and might tend to be reaching towards the lower through the lower portion of the light curtain anyway. Because remember, it's a simple fix. All you have to do is move the, the light curtain down several inches to take care of that exposure. Okay, great, next question. May a locked off e-stop push button meet the requirement of OSHA lockout? Could you repeat the first part of that again? Did you say lock, box, push buttons? A locked off e-stop push button meet the requirement of OSHA lockout? Oh. Locked off push buttons. No, that can be part of your lockout tag out program, but it certainly shouldn't be the only thing. To have an emergency stop that's got a locking tab on it is what I'm assuming you're talking about. Okay, next question. On the shields shown, are they required by OSHA or a safety recommendation? Well, remember that uh, the answer is both because OSHA does mention chips and coolant to be controlled, and the easiest, really the only way, the only common way to do that is with a shield to control chips. That could also be a 1910-212 issue in that you need to control chips and coolant to, to, to protect people, and therefore how are you going to do it? Well, usually it comes back to a simple chip and coolant shield. Will OSHA cite the lack of a shield? Yes, I have heard that, although it, you know, different interpretations in different places might make that decision. But I have heard of getting cited for the lack of a shield when it's obvious that the PPE ain't doing it by itself. Next question. For bilingual operations, picture danger signs would be beneficial. Do you have any thoughts on that? Yes. You need danger signs. They need pictograms. They may also need verbiage. And as I understand, since 2010, uh, OSHA has specified that the operators need to be trained in their native language for these. So they may have to provide training in English, Spanish, whatever it might be. There's a reference to the uh, assistant um, director of OSHA, uh, David Michaels, I think it was, back in 2010 about that. Okay, great. Next question. Just to clarify, all drill presses must have a guard for potential debris, is that correct? As a cutting and turning machine or chip making machine uh, that's throwing chips in coolant, you, the end user, have to determine whether or not the chips or coolant are creating a hazard. Normally, if the chips or coolant are being thrown up the operator's upper body, even though he or she may be wearing a face shield or safety glasses, that's a problem. It needs to be controlled by a chip shield or if the chips are accumulating in the workspace or aisle where the operator is standing, creating a slip trip hazard, that's a problem. It may be controlled by a chip coolant shield. Okay, great. And that's all the time we have for questions today. Please join me in thanking Roger Harrison and Carrie Halley for their presentation, as well as our sponsor, Rockford Systems, LLC. If you have any additional questions or comments, please don't hesitate to click the Email Us button on the console. As you exit today's webinar, please take a couple minutes to complete our survey. We strongly welcome your detailed comments. Please visit webinars.ishn.com 
for the archive of this presentation, as well as information about our upcoming events. We appreciate your time and hope you have found this webinar to be a valuable experience.